Um, I'm actually going to change things up here a little bit before we dismiss the kids. Um, I'm going to have Thaddeus come up. I've asked Thaddeus to give his testimony today. We're continuing on with our testify series um, or our experiment. And so I'm, I'm going to ask Thaddeus to come up before I dismiss the kids because I want the younger ones to listen. Uh, we've had a lot of more mature people come up and Christianity is not something only for a certain age bracket. It's not only for when you get to a certain point in life. So I want Thaddeus to come up if you would and, and share his testimony. But you want a microphone or can you speak loud? Can you speak loud now? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> okay. For a long time, about two months before I got saved, I always wanted things. Can I have this? Can I have that? One time, when I was seven, I asked Dad for an Indiana Jones Lego set, and then he said, come here. We sat down face to face, and he said, do you know what being a Christian means? Normally, I would have said, yes. But this time, I don't know why. I just said, no. I don't remember exactly what he said after that, but I remember he took me to the table, prayed for me, and after the prayer, I felt changed. At that moment, I chose to live my life to serve God. I knew God had taken out my evil, dark heart and replaced it with a good heart, even though at that time I didn't completely understand salvation. I tried to preach to a kid at school named Joe, but he found it amusing. I kept preaching to him, and then it just became annoying to him. I now obey what Jesus says, to shake the dust off your feet. I think God is going to use me as a missionary in this country. A lot of people go far off country and leave to preach. But they don't realize a major satanic conflict is where we live. I got saved, and I hope you all are or will too. <laughs> Now, the reason I had Thaddeus share his <coughs> testimony before I dismiss the kids is because I want to share something a little bit more of my testimony. You see, Christian and I uh, met each other at, at, through church. We went to a Bible college together. We got married. Uh, she has a degree in church music. I have a degree in, in pastoral ministries. And we have five kids. And the five kids grew up in a Christian home. So they're Christians, right? Genetically. They have to be Christians. I mean, that's how it works, right? And they went to Sunday school. They went to PBS. They went to youth group. They sang all the songs. They knew all the verses. And I was shocked. I was rocked to the core when Benjamin called from creation, the first year he went out to creation, and he said, Dad, I got saved. No, that's, that's just one of those emotional things. You didn't even say, no, Dad, I got saved. We'll talk about it when you get home. And a couple days later, he came home, and Chris and I were talking about this. Okay, what are they doing at creation? What kind of wackos are they having out there? <laughs> and we pulled up in the parking lot out here, and, and Benjamin was out actually moving stuff, and he looked different. So I stopped and I thought, okay, what's going on here? Now, I, maybe I'm jaded, I don't know. But when somebody tells me that they've come to the Lord, I watch. I sit and I wait and I watch. Because, see, Christianity is not an emotional, heartfelt moment. Christianity is the endurance run. It's the long haul. And Jesus talks many times about those that start off on fire and fizzle out. And so, when Benjamin told me he got saved and I saw the change in his life, that really shocked Christian. I said, how come my son who was a Christian, who grew up in a Christian home, get saved? So Christian and I confronted the other children. And of the other four children, only one had a testimony. One out of five. And that was Christian. And he remembered the day Actually, it was an end evening. He went and prayed by himself and after a conversation. And, and he had a testimony. And Christian and I started praying, God, save our kids. You know, when you're not praying, I mean, you're ignorant. And within the course of, was it about two and a half years? Um, it was a few months after Benjamin got saved. 
we went out to Promise Keepers, uh, the one out in uh, Spokane. And Dennis invited us to go, and me, Christopher, Dom, and Benjamin all went out. I will not sleep in a bed with baby Benjamin again. <laughs> in the floor. Donovan gave his heart to the Lord that weekend. Um, about six months later, we were doing a marriage group. And Donovan and Benjamin and Mackenzie were watching the kids downstairs. I don't know who started the fight. I don't know who got into the fight. But there was a fight downstairs. Not, not a, I don't think it was a fist fight. <laughs> and, and there was an explosion. There was some going back and forth. And they resolved it on their own. And Mackenzie, who was watching Donovan and Benjamin, was amazed at the change in these two brothers of hers. And they led her to the Lord. Well, Thaddeus, about a year later, we've been going back and forth, and, and Thaddeus, <coughs> how old were you, Zach? Seven, I think. I am always speculative when people say, oh yeah, I met the Lord at an early age. Because of my own children's experience growing up in church and knowing the pro forma answers. But I talked with Thaddeus and, and we had a conversation and I told him, I, want, I don't want you to answer me right now. I want you to think about this and then we're going to talk a couple days later. So a few days went by and I called him out and we talked. And uh, I got to lead my son to the Lord. <laughs> And I want to share with you, don't expect because your kids grew up in church that they know the Lord. Don't expect that because you grew up in church that you know the Lord. Because he says to me, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. They're going to acknowledge him as Lord and he's going to say, I don't know you. And that's a terrifying thing. Okay? It's terrifying to think that because we were complacent with our church attendance, that we were comfortable with our knowledge of Scripture, and we could tell the stories. We could sing the songs, and we could put on the facades. But He judges justly and in truth. He divines the intent of the heart. And if your heart is not His, you won't go to heaven. You won't make it. Because He says, Broad is the way that leads to death, and many trod upon it. And narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Look at, around you, people. That includes us. That means that there are many here that are in danger of not going to heaven. And i got to share with you. I have been struggling all week with this message because I don't feel like I can do justice to the passage that we're doing. And I've been struggling in my heart because I've, I've been reading the book, Not a Fan. And I have been checked in several places in my walk with God where I have put on a facade of a follower of Christ and really only been a fan. And I want to share with you today, when you come to Christ, you die. It costs you your life. Okay? You cannot come to the cross any other way but to die. And if you hold anything back, then you're not His. You are not His. And he will say to you, I don't know you. You see, it's not enough to call him Lord. You have to be his slave. And when he says go, you go. And when he says stop, you stop. When he says give it up, you give it up. You give up the rights that you think you have to your life. And you take on the cross. A sign of indignity. A sign of death. Not this cute little gold thing you wear around our neck. We're talking.
walking a blood-stained cross. That is what we are called to. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, Discipleship, he said, when God, when Christ bids a man come, he bids him come and die. And if you have not died, if you have not given up the rights to your life, you're not saved. You're just mimicking salvation. And you will be rejected on that day. And that is terrifying. Because do we really understand what hell is? The place of eternal torment that was not created for us. Do you know that? It was not created for us. It was created for Lucifer and the fallen angels. God needed a place to put them away from His presence. But the men and women that reject Him and His Son will be there too. The only place in all of existence that God is not. See, God causes His rain to fall on the just and the unjust right now because of His grace, His mercy, His love. You think this life is bad? You are sitting under God's grace right now. Whether or not you've accepted it, you are sitting under His grace. And the bad things that come up in your life are calling to you. You don't think God allows bad things in your life? He will do what is necessary to draw you to Him. To drive you to Him. We're going to do uh, communion this morning. In Corinthians, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. We do a little bit... We always do communion on the first Sunday of the month, the same Sunday that we have our potluck, and that's for a reason. Because the communion is, is reflective of the Passover dinner, the gathering together and the sharing of the Passover meal. I want the children to stay in here. We're going to go ahead and do communion with them as well. We do potluck because we fellowship together after church. Now see, that's, that's a dynamic we're going to change in this church. I'm, I'm tired of the silly facade that we call fellowship. Where we get together, we talk about the same old things, and we keep everything on the surface so that nothing hurts. So that nothing is sensitive. Look, God has established the church as His body to function in the role that He played in this earth. Okay, That's how He established it. So we're going to talk about that in Colossians today. If you would join with me in prayer, Father, we thank you so very much for the sacrifice of your Son, Lord God, that before creation of time, you had set a plan in place for our salvation. Lord God, we thank you for the broken body of your Son and his shed blood on our behalf. I ask, Father, that we would remember this day in and day out, that, Father, this would be at the forefront of our minds in everything that we do. I ask a blessing on us, Father, today in the reading of your word. I invite your presence that you would be honored. We thank you for these things, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, children, go ahead and dismiss to Sunday school in the back building. It always amazes me how many adults are No 10 to 12. No 10 to 12. 9 to 12. 9 to 12 or 9 to 12. Yeah, 9 to 12. 9 to 12 is staying in church.
we are in the book of Colossians. We are all the way up to verse 17. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. I'm actually going to back up. I'm going to start reading in verse 15. Paul writes, He, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the ch of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Now, we're up to verse 17. He is before all things. Okay, last week we talked about the idea of, of Jesus, um, the firstborn of all creation. And we talked about how the Greek word actually means begets. So he's like the first parent or the first begetter, not like the firstborn, like he was not born like we were. Okay? Um, he is sovereign God. He has always existed. He will always exist. Obviously, it doesn't mean to a chronological time because he was born 2,000 years ago, but we have 4,000 some years of history before him. So we know he wasn't born first that way. But we kind of run back into the same issue in verse 17. And he is before all things. Now, literally the way this translates is, before everything is, he was. Meaning that, like in, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning. Well, that, that is only relative to us. Okay? It's not relative to God, because he has no beginning. He's always existed. He's infinite. So when it says, in the beginning, the reference is to us. Okay? So when he's talking here, it says, he is before all things. He's before anything that was created was created. Jesus was. Okay, so taking this all together, we understand it can't be that he was firstborn of creation, a created being, because he existed before anything was created. All right, so, and in him all things hold together. This is an, an amazing thought when, when you really grab a hold of this. Look, if Jesus did not constantly will that things stayed together, they would fall apart. Thermodynamics tells us, the laws of thermodynamics tell us, that when things left to themselves, without any outside interference, they tend toward decay. Okay? That's a law. It's been proven over and over and over again. It's the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Okay? So when things are left to themselves, they decay. If Jesus, being God, did not will that things held together, nothing would exist. It would all just fall apart. Done. Okay? So, the fact that things hold together is an active part of God's will. Do you understand that? Even with all the terrible things going on, even with all the terrible things going on, even with the crazy people going in and shooting up kindergartens. Even with mile and a half wide tornadoes going through urban areas in Oklahoma. Even with earthquakes causing tsunamis that wipe out entire cities. Even with all of that in play, if God did not will it, nothing would exist. Do you understand that? 
Do you really understand that? Because see, if you don't get that, you can't even begin to fathom the power of our God. You can't even begin to fathom the power of our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not just the fleshly part that God punted down to earth to take care of business. Jesus Christ is God made in the flesh. Fully God, fully man. Meaning that he had everything at his disposal to do as he would while he walked at 33 years, 33 plus years on this earth. He had all the authority to do whatsoever he would and yet did not. For our sake. Even being scourged and whipped, he held things together. Even being nailed to a cross, he held things together. Even being in the grave for three days, he held things together by his will. Now, Thank God, I am not God. Man, the first time somebody slapped me upside the head, <laughs> done. <laughs> Sorry, but you're all dust. I'll make a whole bunch more of you. Okay? But he didn't do that. He held it together. So, he is before all things, he's first, and in him everything holds together. Moving on to verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. <clears throat> he is the head of the body, the church. I don't ever want us to be a church that shies away from things. I don't ever want to be a pastor that shies away from anything in God's word. But I've been shying away from something for quite a while. Because quite honestly, I can't figure out how to say it without it sounding self-serving. The church, the word literally is ecclesia, and it means an assembly, called out ones. Okay? It's a holy assembly. We talked about that a while back. In the American culture, I have never seen such disregard for the body of Christ as we see today. I have never seen such blatant disregard for the commands of Christ as we see today. He has called us to gather together, to worship together. He has called us to come together at appointed times to worship Him. And we so casually disregard that in favor of other things. We so casually throw that aside because something else has come up. Now don't get me wrong. Perfect attendance at church is not going to gain you entry into heaven. It's not going to impress God. I don't care how many stars you got on your little sticker card. It's not going to impress God. But see, this is one area where we absolutely struggle with the Lordship of Christ. Because see, if He is Lord and we are slave, do you know that is the word most often used of Christians? The word in the Greek means slave. Some of the, 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 the translations, they actually soften a little bit by saying servant or bond servant. The word literally means slave. Okay? Now, we don't like slavery. We think back a couple hundred years to how the blacks were treated in the South. We, we rebel against that idea. But they never had God as their master. See, we don't like the idea of slavery, but we're all slaves anyway. But we're the only slaves that get to choose whom to serve. I don't want to, I'm not going to, you can't make me choose. You just chose. Sorry. That's the way it works. So, if Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, and he has said, do not forsake the gathering together with the assembly of saints, and you go, oh, but there's a game! Or, oh, there's a good sale! It's the first...
first weekend of camping. Now, are any of those things in and of themselves wrong? No. No. But I'll tell you what. When you make it easy to miss church, you miss church easily. You find it more and more difficult to come to church. What are the priorities in your life? What are you choosing to put at the head of your life? Entertainment? Self? Kids? You know, Jesus talks in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He says that if anyone would follow me, so there's a choice. If anyone would, you get a choice. If you would follow me, you have to what? Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. See, when you come to the cross, you die. All of your priorities have of necessity to be rearranged. They have to. They have to. Now listen, I'm, I'm going to tell you. If it came down to you not coming to church here and going somewhere else, go somewhere else. Lord God, please, go somewhere else. Fellowship with the body of Christ. Okay? Rather than not go anywhere, look, I love you, but if it is between me and eternity, go somewhere else and choose eternity. Okay? The body of Christ is flawed because it's made up of people like me that will hurt you like I've been hurt and you will hurt them like I have hurt others. That's the marvelous beauty of the body of Christ is it's based on Christ himself, the image that Christ has given us, which is what? See, the cross wasn't just to kill him. What was the cross for? Ultimately, it was for the forgiveness of all mankind. See, if that's the example set for us, then this should be the place where forgiveness flows over. Right? Right? Remember when Jesus said, if, if, if he forgives us of our sin, how far are they removed? As far as the east is from the west. You know you can never get that far? Can we do any less? In, in uh, Matthew, I believe it's chapter 5, Jesus says, If you do not forgive others, God will not forgive you. Now, is that saying that as a Christian, if you carry a grudge, you're, you're kicked out? No, I think what he's really saying is that if you're carrying a grudge, you really can't be a Christian. you understand that? I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Lord God, I know some of you have been hurt. <clears throat> you carry hurts in your life from things that have happened in your past, and I know it's not easy. <clears throat> but see, the sin against you was first against God. The hurt against you was first against God. As parents, you know what it's like if somebody hurts your child. You hurt for them. Now you want to go out for blood. If you don't think God has that same feeling, read Revelation. Read Revelation. We talked a couple weeks ago about Jesus coming back. See, he came the first time as the suffering servant, the lamb led to slaughter. He's coming back the second time. He's not going to be a lamb. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back in power and might. And all who are not with him oppose him. <clears throat> and they will face justice. Now, I'm not opposed to Jesus. No, 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 no. That's not what I said. If you are not with him, 
You are opposed to him. I'm neutral. There is no neutrality. There is no neutrality. Because if you have not accepted him, you have rejected him. There is no other alternative. There is none. It is just him or not him. When you say, I'm not involved, I'm a neutral party, you have rejected him. And you stand in light of his judgment. And you have forsaken his mercy. See, God is perfect. He's the only perfect thing we will ever know. And yes, he is perfect in love. Without him being perfect in love, we would not have the cross. We would not have a way to be saved. <coughs> but he's also perfect in justice. And he is perfect in judgment, divining even the intent of our heart. You ever messed up in your sin? I don't mean by your sin messed up. But you intended to sin and you blew it? Because you, you couldn't even sin right? <laughs> He, he divines even the intent. See, a, a lot of people look at living under the law in the Old Testament as having been hard. And because we live in the dispensation of grace, we don't understand how much harder the New Testament is. Because see, in the Old Testament they said, don't kill. I have never killed anyone in, well, birds. <laughs> Little things that run across the road this they're dead. <laughs> With intent, I have never killed anyone or anything. Okay? But Jesus said that's not sufficient. He said if you hate your brother, you have already committed murder in your heart. Now, I have my old Bible. I think I told you this. I have my old Bible. It was given to me when I was 16 years old. Uh, Mackenzie was reading it for a while. I don't know if she still is. If you look at my old Bible, there every passage that talks about your brother is underlined in red, and to the side of it are the initials TLVN. That's my brother Todd. Because I spent a lot of my life hating my brother. Now, he and I are 15 months apart. I was born bigger than he was. Taller. Taller. Not wider. <laughs> we are about as opposite as you can get. Okay? I'm an egghead. He's a hands-on. Okay? I like to read. I don't think he's ever read an instruction manual in his life. He's got a garage full of extra parts. <laughs> I know, I've told you this before. I open the box, first thing I do is I pull out the instruction manual and sit down and read it. I know, it's one of those flaws. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> We are as opposite as we can get. When we were about 12 years old, 11 and 12 years old, my brother and I, we used to be very, very close. We used to do everything together. <clears throat> um, hormones kicked in. All of a sudden, he was doing like weird stuff, like combing his hair and brushing his teeth <laughs> without being told. <laughs> you know, this is back in the days of long hair and pocket combs with the handles that stuck out your pocket. And my brother would be doing this thing. <clears throat> <laughs> and leather jackets. What is wrong with you? All of a sudden in church where, you know, in Sunday school where we sat on one side of the room and the girls sat on the other side of the room, they started kind of moving around in a circle until they were sitting next to each other. What is wrong with you? And we, we diverged. And I'll tell you what, I enjoyed needling him and he enjoyed pounding me. And you would think that my intellect would have prevented me from needling him just out of survival mode. <laughs> but it didn't. And boy, I could needle him. And boy, he could pound me. I took a lot of beatings. Okay? But see, when I was confronted with the fact, I believe it's in 1 John, says that if you claim to love the Lord and you hate your brother, then you cannot know the love of God. Oh. And so I, start, I did a study. I went back and I started reading. About 16 years old, I started marking in my Bible everything that had to do with how I dealt with my brother. And I realized 
that the, the forgiveness and the grace that God would extend toward me would block by my own response to my brother. Okay, now, I don't think that passage is really talking necessarily of a physical brother. For me, that happened to be the case, physical brother. But for you, it may not be a physical brother. It may be somebody in the church. Okay? Maybe somebody in your past. Maybe somebody uh, in the community. I, I don't know. But see, if, if you are harboring a grudge against them, if you are holding on to dear life, see, when you die, you, you don't hold on to anything. You give up rights to everything. Quite honestly, do um, you think when they're laying in the coffin they care what they wear? Do you think they care what their hair looks like? <clears throat> Do you think they care what kind of bouquet is put on their casket? Do you think they care who showed up? They don't care. And see, that's the call to which we are called to our walk in Christ, as he is the head of the church. If he has given us directives he, in, in uh, one of the, the Gospels, he says, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? Why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? Now, are, are we expected to do this perfectly? No, we're expected to do it increasingly. That, that's maturity. We, we grow in this. We grow in this. I hope by God that I am further along today than I was a year ago. Sometimes I wonder. This week really has had me puzzling and, and checking myself and grading myself. And quite honestly, there are some grades that I have, I have fallen pretty darn low probably right there around the net. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now, the firstborn from the dead, you know, Jesus was not the first person to be resurrected, right? Okay, we know that. Uh, we know just a little while before this, he resurrected Lazarus. So how could he be the firstborn from the dead? He's the firstborn from the dead that never died again. Resurrected to new life. See, um, he is the one that the first fruits from the dead, 1 Corinthians tells us that, that by his resurrection from the dead, we can know that we too will be resurrected to new life. Not to die again. So he is the firstborn from the dead, not meaning chronological. He's not in competition with, you know, the, uh, uh, what was the, 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 the uh, synagogue leader's daughter, and he said Talitha Kum. Everybody thinks her name was Talitha or Tabitha. No, that's just the name that he said when he was telling her to, to rise. Okay? He, he's not in competition with her. Oh, dang it, she was raised before me. No. He's the firstborn from the dead, meaning that he is born unto everlasting life, never to die again. By this we know that we too will be resurrected to never die again. I hope that fills you with hope. Because see, remember we talked about the path, the wide path and the narrow path? The wide path is to eternal destruction. It's like suffering cancer for eternity, never having the relief of death. The narrow path is unto life. As a matter of fact, it's unto life better than we know it here. Because see, right now we're looking at everything dim. What does Paul say? Right now we see as through a glass dimly. Then we shall see face to face. See, right now, our entire relationship is based on faith. Then it will be done on faith. Do you get that? Right now, we're believing, not having seen. We're trusting in what he has said. That's faith. Hebrews chapter 11, check it out. That's faith. But then it's going to be faith. Because, see, we will stand before him. And we will see him face to face. As unlike anyone has ever seen him face to face before. First 
Son from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. What does preeminent mean? Yeah. Supreme, first, surpassing, above all others. Now, I'm going to take you back a little bit to our introduction in Colossians. Remember we talked about the Gnostics and their ideas and that Jesus was probably not God. He was probably an angelic being, much like we have the Jehovah's Witness today saying that he was uh, the Archangel Michael. Okay? He has the preeminence. So first, if he created everything, he couldn't be an angel because the angels are created beings. If he has preeminence, that means he's above surpassing all things. Now, that can only be said of God. That can only be said of God. Because see, I can talk about um, Josh, I'm going to talk about Josh. <coughs> Josh is faster than I. He, he surpasses me in speed. Nick surpasses me in ability to do push-ups. You have to be able to do one to compete. <laughs> <laughs> I can beat him laying on the floor. <laughs> <clears throat> but see, somebody else can surpass them. And on and on and on and on. And you get to the greatest athlete of all time. I don't know who that is. I don't care. But then we get into the whole angelic thing and demonic thing. And Daniel talks about the heavenly messenger that was sent to Daniel and was waylaid by the prince of Persia. Okay, so evidently they got competition levels too. <clears throat> because the archangel Michael had to come and assist him to be able to deliver the message. So it goes on and on and on and on and on all the way up. There's only one thing that is unsurpassed in everything, and that is God himself. All three parts. God himself, of which Jesus is. God himself. Okay? That he might be preeminent. He is above all things, and he lowered himself to our position, taking on the form of a servant, dying on a cross on our behalf. Read Philippians chapter 2. See, this is the model that we are to have. This is the model that we are supposed to have. Flip over there with me real quick. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to close on this, okay? I'm going to read in, uh, starting in verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. I see that's a problem right there. Because the majority of what we do, we do for self. But in humility, count each other more significant than yourselves. Doesn't matter whether you can do more, whether you have more things, whether you have more intellect. Doesn't matter. We are to count them better than ourselves. See, my mom used to say when I was a kid, my mom used to teach Sunday school, and she had this um, acronym, JOY, right? Jesus, others, yourself. That's the order of priority. Jesus, others, yourself. I don't like that. Quite honestly, I think it should be Joe. <laughs> Jesus, others. Because we think we, 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 oh, I'm on the list. Check this out, man. I am on the list. No. See, you've already missed the point. It shouldn't be about you. You should remove yourself from any position in there. Okay? Moving on. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, that's part of the fellowship that I'm talking about. This is, this is part of the fellowship that I'm talking about. I don't want this surface stuff. I don't want this stuff where we get together and talk about the same old things. I want to have fellowship where we get together and we can share those things inside. Where we have such trust in each other that we can share the interests of others. 
It's not talking about your favorite baseball team. It's not talking about your favorite hobby or arts and crafts thing. This is talking about the interests of others. It's everything. What is important to you should be important to me. What is important to me should be important to you. See, the only time it comes into conflict is in when you and I both think that what's important to each of us is more important than what's important to the other one. Go back to Job. Jesus, others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is the mind we are to have. It's the mind given to us. Okay? This is part of what wages war with the members of our flesh. Okay? This is the mind of Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay? So here we have the preeminent Christ, surpassing all others. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. See that word? That's slave. Okay? Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. Okay, so he's already lowered himself. Can you imagine being preeminent and coming down to one of the lesser creatures? What is man that thou art mindful of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. Okay, so he's already moved down several categories just to be with us. And being found in human form, he became king and emperor of all. No. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above all names. Now listen, when you come to Christ, everybody wants to come to be the prince and the princess. But the only way to come is by being a slave. So you can't come in to the throne room of God and say, where's my crown? Jesus tells a parable. And he says that the servant is working out in the field. And he comes in and he says, what servant would say to his master, I'm going to go and eat myself? No, wouldn't you rather the master say to you, fix my dinner, clean yourself up, fix my dinner, prepare for me, and when that's done, then you can go and eat. We all too often gripe and complain about working in the field. Much less come in and after a hard day's work, continue to serve. See, that's the life he has called us to, to be a slave. When we grasp that, when we grasp hold of this, then he exalts us and gives us a crown. He exalts us and gives us a crown. God can exalt you so much better than you can exalt yourself. God can lift you to higher heights than you can ever lift yourself. Don't trust in your ability to make your case before God for honor's sake. Humble yourself. Become obedient, even to death. Even unto death. See, everybody wants the quick death. Nobody wants the slow death. What if the death that he has for you is a death that takes 60 years to complete? of denying yourself, facing the hardship day in and day out. What if there isn't what we assume glory in your service? What if there isn't the Rolls Royce that the prosperity teachers tell you you will get? What if there isn't the large house? What if it's a mud hut? What if? See, that's the cost. Are you willing to go there? Because if you're not willing to go there, then you have another master in your life. Are you willing to go there? That's what it costs. Amen? Amen.